All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started. Welcome to Star Wars Reader's Theater. Thank you for coming out today. Hopefully everyone's having a good Comic-Con. Welcome to, uh, to the Sunday day, the family day. And what we wanted to do here today is something a little different. Um, you've been to, to many panels before, but I don't think you've ever been to, to one like this. Um, my name is Michael Seglain. I'm the creative director for Lucasfilm Publishing. And I have before, before me um, some extremely talented authors. And you know, we, we always talk about, about the books and what's in the books and uh, you know, how cool they are. But not everyone gets to experience all of the books. And we figured this, is, this day, today, is a day where you guys get to experience them, but in a completely unique way. You get to experience them from the actual authors. And so we're going to make this very conversational and a lot of fun. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves. Um, but today's a day where you get to hear the books from the authors, and, uh, and we're going to have a little bit of fun. So Ian, if you would, take it away just to announce yourself, say you know, who you are, what you, what you did, and, and maybe a little bit about what brought you to Star Wars. Uh, my name is Ian Desher. I'm the author of the William Shakespeare Star Wars series. Uh, thank you. And uh, I... Uh, was brought to Star Wars by my parents. I was sat in Return of the Jedi in the theater at age six, uh, listening to my uncle translate it in Japanese to his wife as we went along throughout the movie, uh, as it went happened. I'm Alex Bracken, it's nice to see you guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm the author of the A New Hope retelling for young readers called The Princess, the Scoundrel, and the Farm Boy. And as you might be able to tell. <laughs> Um, as you might be able to tell, I pitched this to Mike as being the Star Wars Breakfast Club, so I think we'll get into that in a bit. Mm -hmm. But I came to Star Wars through my dad. He was a Star Wars collector and a pretty serious Star Wars collector from the time I was in first grade right up until he passed away a few years ago. So I've been going to conventions for years. I grew up reading Star Wars novelizations, and I'm really excited to be here with you guys. Uh, my name is uh, Adam Gidwitz. I'm the author of um, the retelling of The Empire Strikes Back, So You Want to Be a Jedi. Um, and um, my, uh, thank you. Uh, I came to um, Star Wars um, actually um, through a, a plastic rancor. Um, I used to love the toys, and, and a friend had um, the plastic rancor, which was the coolest, coolest toy I'd ever seen in my life. So through imaginative play was how I came, through, came to Star Wars, which maybe shows up in the book. Hey, I'm Tom Engelberger. I write the Origami Yoda series, and uh, oh, thanks, guys. I've been uh, I've been into uh, Star Wars since I was six and saw it movie theater, 1977, and I've been into origami even a couple years earlier than that. My mother had taught me my first origami, so it was really natural to put them both together. And uh, I had so much fun writing those books. And then that led me to get the offer to write uh, Star Wars. Are we doing the whole title? Because my title is really long. Dead. Star Wars, colon, be Return of the Jedi, colon, Beware the Power of the Dark Side, exclamation point. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Chuck Wendig. Uh, I, hi, hello, hello there. Uh, I'm the author of this little book called Star Wars Aftermath, or if you really want the full title, Journey to Star Wars, colon, The Force Awakens, Star Wars, colon, Aftermath. Uh, I came to Star Wars uh, when I was age four, Empire Strikes, uh, Empire Strikes Back came out, and uh, my sister, who's considerably older, to me, older than me, took me uh, on a date with her boyfriend, uh, with his little brother, to see it at a drive-in theater. And so, uh, so we didn't have to watch her and her boyfriend not watching the movie. Uh, I very diligently watched the movie. So uh, that sort of burned into my brain, and from there I've been pickling and brining in the universe. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So we're going to get started with, uh, with Ian. And Ian, right before you, you jump into this, if you could just uh, give the, the audience a sentence or two about the books. You've done all three of them now. So for anyone who doesn't know what they are. So these are uh, retellings of the Star Wars movies as though they were plays written by Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, we're going here in canonical order. So Tragedy of the Sith's Revenge just came out in September, a uh, title that I almost can't say. 
Uh, so I'm going to give you just a, a handful of uh, little speeches from that. So the opening prologue, uh, which is the opening crawl of the movie, is a Shakespearean sonnet. War is the cry that doth through space resound. The good republic faces bold attack from Dooku, he whose evil doth abound. Yet heroes rise as each side fighteth back. Droid leader General Grievous, he most vile, hath entered, a new player on the scene. With movement swift and unexpected guile, he hath made bold to kidnap Palpatine. Whilst o'er the capital, in Coruscant, the separatist droid army tries to flee, two Jedi are dispatched upon a jaunt to set the hostage Palpatine full free. In time so long ago begins our play, in vengeful galaxy far, far away. <laughs> So uh, Obi-Wan Obi starts uh, noticing the changes in his friend, and he's concerned about it. Uh, and uh, so here's a, a soliloquy from Obi-Wan, and I know that uh, you and McGregor played him in the movie and not Alec Guinness, but you'll have to forgive me. How do you reach a friend whose spirit <laughs> fails? How sing of hope when hopelessness abounds? How steer them from a course of recklessness? How pull them back when they would fly the edge? My friend, my own young Anakin, is such. The galaxy is at his fingertips, yet he doth brood with anger, quick and sore, as I have never witnessed in a man. I feel he doth begin to lose the spark I first did see in him on Tatooine. That light, as if illumined by the gods, did shine in him and twere a star entire, did rest within the center of his heart. Now though the man is changed as ice to steam, full of that hot and temperate blustering, singeing all those who wander by too near, so swiftly doth he fly into a rage, so fierce is every mood and quick to change. Such anger which I fear shall turn to hate when ordinary disappointments come, which e'er befall a normal human life. How can I veer him off this wayward path? Whatever in my power I may do, I shall, to keep this Anakin from darkness. In, in Shakespeare, you could never have a, a silent scene of Jedi being killed around the galaxy as Order 66 is being carried out. So instead, we have Palpatine, now Sidious, uh, giving a soliloquy about what's going on. Oh, perfect dark and evil strategy come to fruition in a trice. Forsooth, behold the power of the mighty Sith as we release our Order 66. The cloak of death we rapidly unveil and show the reaper grim who waits therein. The Jedi spread throughout the galaxy, engaged in battles with the separatists, shall suffer as no group e'er suffered yet. Those fighting with their little lightsabers or flying into battle in a ship or cruising o'er a planet's bluish shore, each wretched Jedi meets a quick demise. Go, ravens of the dark side, call for death. Feast ye upon the Jedi carrion. Let each rank body of each Jedi knight fall as you peck them into death's embrace. Go, black and lethal banthers of the night, and trample o'er the weak Republic's hopes. Crush all the Jedi who would block your way. Impale them all upon your vicious horns. Go, hounds of hell, and fiercely bare your teeth. Let every Jedi feel your awful bite. Rip limb from limb until their skin doth shred, and flay them whilst they live, that they may scream. Oh, pleasure most profound and sensual, <laughs> to eat the heart of one's own enemies. Would that I could perform the deed myself. Look into every pair of Jedi eyes, and watch as they for mercy humbly beg. Oh, sight most pitiful and wonderful. I'd happily run them through, or choke their throats, or strike them with the lightning of the Sith. Then how mine heart would sing as they expire. My soul would leap to hear their cries of pain. Die, light. Die, any good that ever was. Die, wisdom. Yea, die, virtue. Die, respect. Die, honor. Die, nobility. Die, right. These qualities shall perish on this day. For lo, the Sith do ply their merry tricks. Come, death. Thy name is Order 66. <laughs> and, uh, at the end, uh, at the end uh, we have Yoda giving uh, the final sort of uh, epilogue. Um, and uh, his uh, speech is uh, an acrostic for Marlowe wrote the pre prequels for Sooth. My friends, tis the end. 
As befits a noble queen, regal as the morn, lo, here's Padme all serene, on a coffin borne. Whilst the people of Naboo each a weeping make, watching Padme good and true, resting ne'er to wake. On a ship above in space, there Darth Vader stands. Empires rise, he doth embrace, this with robot hands. Here doth stand the Emperor, eyeing his new plan. Pain the Death Star shall confer, wrecking Alderaan. Ere that time Organa flies, quickly home doth go. Under care of tender eyes, ease shall Leia know. Later, or on Tatooine, sojourns Obi-Wan. Fresh wee Luke is on the scene. Oh, the father's son. Riding E.P. he appears, stranger now, soon friend. Owen and Beru, sans fears, one small, small child shall tend. There may Luke rest many years. Here, friends, tis the end. That was fantastic. We're going to get into uh, a little bit of, of process and, and how you guys approach all this afterwards, but I want to go from Revenge of the Sith into... A New Hope with the Princess, the Scoundrel, and the Farm Boy. How's your Carrie Fisher? You want to <laughs> go? Yeah. So part of the fun of writing this book is that I decided to split the narrative between Leia, Han, and Luke's point of view. And in order to flesh out some of the scenes that we don't get to see because they're off camera, I got to actually write those scenes or adapt them from the radio dramas. So that was really cool. Um, so I'm going to read a scene that came from my imagination, from Leia's section. And I have personally always felt that Leia at least, at least once tried to escape after she was taken captive at the beginning of A New Hope. This is someone who rescued herself from her own rescue. So, okay, we're gonna dive right into the scene. There were two shuttles docked below with only a single crew moving carts of supplies towards them. Someone's prepping for a trip, she thought. Her mind worked at light speed, and she saw her escape plan unfold as clearly as if the Emperor himself had rolled out a carpet for her. Yes, a small thrill of victory raced through her. She could work with that. Her spirits lightened for the first time in hours, and she felt the crushing pressure lift off, her, lift off her chest. The shuttles would be fueled, and the shuttles would be outfitted with weapons. She could blast her way out, and by the time they realized what was happening, she'd be through Tatooine's atmosphere. If I don't get shot out of the sky first, she thought. No, no, she could do it. She'd had years of flight training. And, well, there were all of those dunes to hide in. Let's see how Vader liked getting gritty sand in sensitive places in his armor. She, <laughs> she found her chance as two of her escorts broke away, heading into a nearby command room. She had to guess to begin processing her into the detention block. Leia allowed the others to push her into another elevator. The doors had barely shut when she swung her bound hands toward the control panel with a thwack, causing the car to jerk to stop. The stormtroopers next to her were thrown off balance, giving her a chance to swipe one of their blasters and fire. Stop! Too late for that laser brain, Leia thought, glancing down at their stunned forms. Neither of them had the keys to her binder. B binders, excuse me. She reached up to pull one of the dozen pins out of her hair and went to work jamming the electronic lock. Like binders mattered. She could fly herself out of there, blind, deaf, and with both arms and legs bound behind her back. The second the elevator door hissed open, Leia slipped out and scanned the empty hallway. She turned back and fired a shot at the elevator's control panel. The door shrieked in protest, jamming over and over and over on one of the stormtroopers' feet. Leia blew a stray piece of hair out of her eyes in a huff of annoyance as she kicked the foot back into the car. The elevator door slammed shut. Leia kept, kept to the edge of the corridor, hanging back a few steps from the hangar's entrance. The air on the ship was dry and freezing cold, but Leia felt damp with sweat. Pulse fluttering, she watched the engineers step through the hangar door together, speaking quietly. They turned, heading away from her. Leia was still clutching the stolen blaster as she slipped inside and made a run for the shuttle. The boarding ramp was down. Her mind sorted through the dangers quickly, like she was flicking through a stack of Sabbat cards. If no one was on board, she could just go. If someone was on board, then she'd need to stun him, but she could use him as a hostage. The stars, her aunts would have expired on the spot at hearing that unprincess-like thought. Two or three people inside would pose somewhat more of a challenge. The thought slid to halt the same moment her feet did. Standing at the top of the shuttle's boarding ramp, hands on his hip, as solid and large as any of Alderaan's mountains, was Darth Vader. Clap 
for very myself nice. awkwardly. Good job for yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. That brings us next to uh, Adam Gidwitz and So You Want to Be a Jedi. And your book is a little different than the rest because if you want to talk a little bit about your, your Jedi lessons, yeah, sure. um, I thought we might do one of those instead of an actual reading. Sounds good. Okay. So um, my approach, the book is called So You Want to Be a Jedi. And my approach was, my books um, previous to Star Wars are um, for you know, eight to 13 year olds and up. Um, and um, my goal was to try to get um, these kids, some of whom love Star Wars already and some of whom don't, as close to the movies, as into the movies as I possibly could. And the way that I wanted to do that was um, I cast you as Luke Skywalker. So uh, you want to be a Jedi, I'm going to train you. You fight the battles on Hoth, you are trained by Yoda, you face Vader at the end. And in between each chapter, there is a Jedi lesson to teach you some of the uh, most important um, lessons, elements of mastering the force yourself. So, I'm gonna do a Jedi lesson in one second for all of you guys. If uh, there are any people out here, especially young people who would like to be a volunteer yeah, to try the Jedi lesson, the get yourself ready, just sort of mentally prepare yourself, perhaps to volunteer to be a Jedi yourself. I'm gonna come down on the floor of the stage where it'll be easier to do the lesson. Yeah, if we could bring up the lights, that would be great. Don't clap yet, you don't know what he's about to do to the children. <laughs> <laughs> don't mess this up, Tom. So, the first stage of the Jedi lesson we can all do together. You need to be sitting in a comfortable position. Both feet on the floor if you can. If you can't reach, that's cool. Um, yeah, yeah don't, don't, don't come up yet. Just stay there, I'll, I'll call on people if you're ready. Um, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to breathe in your nose and out of your nose and try to focus only on your breath. Don't think about the room we're in. Don't think about all the people around you. Don't think about the awesome costumes you've been seeing all day. Just think about your breath in and out, in and out. When you feel like you're calm and focusing only on your breath, if you would like to try the next stage of the Jedi test, you may calmly raise your hand and I will choose someone who looks like he or she is ready to take a Jedi test. All right, you can open your eyes. I see a young man right there. Why don't you come on up, sir? Come on up. Give me a hand. All right, face the audience. What's your name? Robert Chabolsi. Okay, what's your first name? Robert. Robert, okay, Robert. Robert, um, I want you to face me now. Ignore them. We're gonna just get ready um, to do the Jedi test. You're just gonna step back. Good. Look at me. Close your eyes and just breathe in and out. Just get yourself focused. And when you feel like you're really calm and focused, you can open your eyes and let me know and we'll move on to the next stage. Great. I love that Robert didn't just open it. When I asked him to, he knew that he was ready. Robert, the next stage is you are gonna meditate like you were just doing while balancing this book on your head. You ready? See if you can put your hands down and relax your body while keeping the book balanced. Yeah, you can do it. Breathe in and out. Nice. Very nice. Give him a hand. All right, take the book down. You're not done yet. You want to do the next stage? It gets a little bit harder. You are going to balance that book on your head again. Not yet. You're going to keep your eyes open. And I am going to throw my dirty laundry at you. <laughs> and while I do that, what I want you to do is you're gonna keep your hands up and just try to block them. Don't hit them too hard and try to keep the book balanced on your head while I throw my dirty laundry at you. You ready? Okay. Stay calm, this is, this is uh, not easy. Okay. Nice, nice. Okay, good. Ooh, ooh, keep your eyes open, keep your eyes open so you can block them. See, see if you can do one more. Give a hand, everybody! The force is indeed strong with you, sir. Nice to meet you. Go have a seat. Wait, and, and Robert, for, for being a, a great Robert, Padawan. Robert, come back. Come oh, yeah, back, Robert. We have a little t-shirt for Show you. Show everybody the t-shirt, buddy. Hold it up. Give Robert a hand. 
So then just to, to clarify, in between the chapters of Adam's book are these uh, Jedi lessons. So as you go along, you will learn how to become a Jedi. Um, you know, I don't know if you'll be able to levitate things by the end of the book, but you know, hey, reread it a couple times and you might be. Um, so from Empire Strikes Back, we go to Tom Anglerberger and Return of the Jedi. Yes, thank you. I got to do Return of the Jedi, which was the one I wanted to do when they called and asked me. Now, um, I do want to do a, a spirited reading here, um, but the, um, well, I, I don't necessarily do the voice as good as Ian, so uh, I was going to have you guys help me out. Uh, a wise person once told me the world is divided into two types of people, Landos and Neonoms, right? You guys, you know who Neonom is, right? We're, right? Everybody's with me on this? This is the co-pilot, Lando's co-pilot, when they raid the Death Star at the end of Return of the Jedi. How many people, because see, I'm, a Nia, I'm no Lando. I'm a Nia Num myself. How many, <laughs> are, are there any other Nia Num type people out here? Any more people? What? <laughs> uh, wait a minute, are you going to tell me the rest of you are all Landos? Who's a Lando? Don't we look like Lando? Wait, where are all the rest of you that if you're not Landos or Nia Noms? Okay, you got to choose. You got to make your choice out. You got to be either Lando or Nia Num because you're going to have a duty. Lando, I don't want to spoil it, but he's going to blow up the Death Star in a minute. And after he blows up the, de after he blows up the Death Star, he says, Yahoo. Am I right? People, are you with me here, or do we need to go back to the Ewok chapter, okay? All right, you're going to yell, Yahoo. The others of you that identify as Vietnam, what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. All right, one, I got one person here, you're going to do it. You're going to laugh with pure joy. Pure joy, okay? Are you, can you guys even handle this? How many people are going to do the Lando? And I need every hand to go up for one of these. Who's going to do the Lando? And who's going to do the Nia Num? Chuck, Chuck has his own line after the <laughs> Okay, so, okay. All right, I, if you guys aren't with me, I'm going to look like a fool, okay? So I'm counting on you people. Chapter 71. That's right, 71 <laughs> chapters. Actually, there's more than 71 in which the whole thing explodes. Okay. Now, I don't want to read the whole chapter. There's a lot in this book, man. I just packed, I packed it in there, man. Okay. All right, Wedge, go for the power regulator on the side tower. Copy, Gold Leader. I'm already on my way out, comes the response. Wedge fires his torpedoes and then peels away. You guys remember Wedge, right? Yes, all right, Wedge. You didn't think I was going to leave out Wedge. No, I love Wedge. They ex the torpedoes explode into a huge metal structure perched on the side of the reactor. The Falcon keeps straight ahead until it's almost swallowed by the glowing mass at the center. Nia Dumb fires directly into it, and then Lando hauls on the wheel to just barely avoid the reactor and follow Wedge back to the surface. But behind them, the reactor is exploding. Will they get out in time? Out in the relative safety of the space battle, Akbar has heard Wedge and orders... You want to pull that, pull that right now? Move the, uh, move the fleet away from the Death Star. Move the fleet away from the Death Star. Yes, very good. <laughs> yes. A feeling of triumph and, yes, disbelief grows inside Akbar. After all these years of fighting the Empire, it is about to be destroyed. But will the Falcon be destroyed with it? Unnoticed by either the panicking Imperials or the triumphing Rebels, Darth Vader's own shuttle slips out of a docking bay and heads for the forest moon, carrying Luke and what remains of Anakin Skywalker. Yes, good, we figured Luke would get out in time, but what about the Falcon? Lando fires the afterburners and the Falcon screams through another tunnel, clipping corners and smashing through anything that looks smashed throughable. Yes, yes, we know the Falcon's fast, but is it faster than the explosion of the largest reactor the galaxy's ever seen? No, it's not. For a moment, it looks like they might outrun the explosion, but just as Lando and Nia Num see starlight at the end of the tunnel, it catches up with them, consumes them, engulfs them in a white hot fireball. The Death Star has gone supernova. Everything melts or burns or detonates or sometimes all three. Well, not quite everything, reader. Not quite everything. The Millennium Falcon is a very special ship. It's not just her speed. Solo and Jewie have made some special modifications themselves. So, from out of the fire cloud, the Falcon bursts into open space. Lando shouts, yeah. and Nia Num laughs with consumed by joy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. 
Uh, it is a joy that will spread and grow as the news goes out. The galaxy is free again. Or is it? <laughs> Nicely done, Tom. And that brings us to Chuck at the end there. So, of course, after the big Ewok party, everything just falls to hell, right? We all know that. <laughs> so, uh, I wrote the book, Star Wars Aftermath, which takes place a few months after uh, the math. <laughs> um, and uh, so, there's a couple little characters people maybe know. Uh, characters called Han Solo and Chewbacca the Wookiee. And I'm going to read an interlude in this book uh, that concentrates on them and a little mission they're going to undertake. And it's a mission that we may see uh, framed in book two of Aftermath, which was announced this weekend, a book called Life Debt. So I cannot do a Wookiee roar. If I do a Wookiee roar, I'll probably just throw up. So <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, interlude, hyperspace. Stars stretch into spears, spears flung through the open black past the Millennium Falcon as it punches a hole through hyperspace. Han Solo scratches at the weeks-long beard growth that's come up over his cheeks. It itches even still, and he makes, the faces, he makes faces as he scratches. Chewie growls at him and points. Yeah, yeah, now I really am some scruffy scoundrel. I grow this face pelt long enough, maybe they'll think I'm you. <laughs> he gives the Wookiee a smirk, and Chewie rumbles a response. Okay, relax, big guy. Nobody's going to confuse me with you. You're like a walking tree covered in hair. Chewie leans back in the co-pilot seat and the streaking star lines reflect in his eyes. He's bored, and a bored Wookiee is a dangerous thing. Last system they were in, Ord Mantell out here in the mid-rim, Chewie got to messing around with the Falcon's navigation system, trying to chase down some glitch that had been screwing up the hyperspace drive. He fixed it, so great, but then the gun stopped working, which of course they only discovered when they were ambushed by a trio of Krish Marauder ships. They got some serious char on their vector plates and hover pads, almost didn't get out of there. Still, it's nice, in a way, being out here with just Chewie. Han misses Leia and Luke, even Lando, though he'd never say that out loud. But being here with his old pal reminds him of his younger days, him, the Wookiee, and the Falcon. No responsibilities besides protecting their own tails. And, of course, getting rich. Which, a small voice reminds him, never happened. <laughs> All right, coming up out of hyperspace, he says, reaching for the throttle to disengage. And as he eases it back, the star lines shorten, and there's that dizzying moment. The one that's never gone away, no matter how many jumps they've made. The one that makes him feel like his brain has been hurled through space while his guts are just a dozen parsecs behind. Then the planet swells into a view ahead of them, Desor. Another on the list of the lawless places. An unruly world, thick with thieves, run by gangs, who are in turn run by a crime cartel, powered by slaves. Too vile even for Solo in his younger days. Thieves he can truck with. Slaves, well, that sets the coals in his stomach to a hot volcanic burn. Chewie warbles and growls and Han answers him. Plan's the same as it's been. Same as it was on Ord Mantell, Ando Prime, Caribbean, and all the rest. He affixes the cybernetic implant over his eye, a telescoping heliodor lens that in fact doesn't work and is totally fake. That plus the scruff and the ugly aviator cap he dons seems like just enough of a disguise to make sure the people down there don't know him at first glance. When Chewie roars in protest, he nods. I know, pal, I know. I'd rather have you there with me too, but if there's one thing that's gonna give us away, it's a smuggler walking around with one of the few dozen liberated Wookiees. But we gotta find the Empire supply lines, and that means me going down there all by my lonesome, kicking up some dust and seeing what it smells like. You just, you just stay close in the Falcon in case things go to garbage. The most recent whispers are that the Empire, after losing some of its traditional supply lines and chips over the last couple of months, has been tightening ranks around the criminal organizations they quietly supported during the last decades. Han's been going down, asking questions, getting to the occasional, fine, more than occasional bar fight, and seeing if anything shakes out. So far, it hasn't. Chewie barks a sharp yip, and Han agrees. Yeah, I hope Wedge is having a better time with mis his mission, too. Let's get planet side in. The calm crackles. Above it, a shimmering blue hologram appears. Han laughs and Chewie waves. Well, Han says, look what's come crawling out of the space waves. The woman, projected by hologram, puts a cocky tilt in her hips. Hey there, you old scoundrel. Old? He feigns distaste. Imra, that hurts me. That hurts me right in my heart. He puts on that winning smile. I will never get old. You think Leia will feel the same way, she asks. Now, that's a low blow. 
She says, you could ditch the princess, you know. Shake off the costume of the law-abiding, upstanding citizen. Come back to the rogue's life. Imra, did you just call to taunt me, or you have something for me? We've got an opportunity with a very small window. Chewy gurgles and Han agrees. Imra, like you said, I'm out of that life, so whatever it is you're bringing to me, she disappears and a new hollow image pops up, a planet. Chewie, agitated, stands and roars, shaking his fists and knocking loose the stabilizer bar above his head. The falcon suddenly shakes and shudders and Han has to quickly reach up and reset the stabilizers. He's about to tell his old friend to calm down, relax, whatever it is that has the big fellow worked up is, and then it hits him. The planet, it's Kashyyyk. It's Chewie's home. A planet whose Wookiees are still in thrall to the Empire. Chewbacca was once a slave like the others, shackled, half-starved, half-mad, his fur matted. He'd worked to cut down the beautiful rusher trees for lumber and farm food that was once theirs in order to feed the Imperial Army. Wookiees were used across the galaxy, too, shipped away to serve as slave labor in mines and in building structures like the Death Stars. Sometimes they even used the poor furballs as science experiments, ripping them open to test out medicines and weapons. Chewie, it's all right, pal, it's all right. Han pats his friend on the shoulder, helps him back into the chair. The Wookiee's muscles ripple under his fur and his lips curl back to reveal his teeth. His breath comes in ragged gasps. To Imra, Han says, what do you mean a window of opportunity? The Wookiee planet's still on lockdown, she says. The Empire doesn't want to give it up, but their ranks are cut. Normally ships come in and they come out and they trade stormtroopers and officers, but the actual weight of their presence never changes. Except now, for a time, it's gonna change. I don't follow. They're gonna do, uh, who can say, a changing the guards, or they need ships for some other planet or some other, I, I really don't know, Solo. The details are fuzzy, but what we do know is the ships that are leaving won't immediately be replaced, which means we have a few days. When, he asks, now. Chewie races his head back and howls. Now, Han leans forward in his chair, suddenly agitated, like today? Almost, clock is about to start ticking in the next day cycle. The Alliance, the New Republic, whatever they are, they got me on this thing. I've got a responsibility. I can't just change the plan, and I can't go off half-cocked. And he knows what the Re New Republic will say. They have a strategy. They won't divert attention to Kashyyyk, not yet. He's asked more than once. Chewie is giving him in this look, not even making a sound. The Wookiee's chest is rising and falling. Then it hits Han. The words coming out of his mouth don't sound like him. Being out here, though, with Chewie, it's made him feel like he used to. They just go places, do whatever they wanted, follow their noses to drink and contraband and snacks of credits and whatever good or bad deeds came along. A fire lights now in Han's belly. It's time to do this. He tells Imra, you won't be big. You remember that? From that time, he pulled a Star Destroyer off her tail and got himself raided in the process. Don't tell me you don't remember. I remember, I remember, it's why I'm here. You said if I ever heard anything about Wookiee World to tell you, here I am telling you. That's not enough, he growls. You gotta do more. She hesitates. How much more? Get everybody. Every right-thinking scamp, scoundrel, slicer, smuggler, anybody who owes me a favor, anybody who hates the Empire like we do. That's not as long as a list as you'd like. Fine, he says. Offer them immunity. If they want their records clear, let them know the New Republic is adding names to a list. Full pardons. Is that true? Sure is, he lies. It's not true. He's never heard that. But it'll make it. he'll make it true, somehow. He turns to Chewbacca. Hey, pal. You still know how to contact the other refugees? Rasha, Kargan, Karatha, and the others? Group of a half dozen Wookiees who escaped Kessel got away from the Empire when no one else could. Group of the meanest, hairiest brutes. They're mercenaries now, and they don't have much care in them when it comes to the politics of the New Republic, but they damn sure will care about liberating their home. Chewie nods and growls in assent. Good, get them together. And Imra, you get the rest. Tell them to meet us outside Warren Station. Like now, hell, yesterday. We don't need the Alliance or the Republic. We do this our way. The Wookiee pumps his long arms in triumph. Imra gives her word and then she's gone. We don't have any plan, pal, he says. The Wookiee growls. We're making this up as we go. Chewie nods and uulates. Good. It's like the old days, buddy. Chewie grabs him with those big arms, shakes him like a cup of dice. Han grins and laughs and tries not to get crushed. Come on, Chewie. Set new coordinates. It's time to get you home. Thank you, Chuck. So as you guys can see, there's, um, there are five authors up here, but there are six microphones. So there's, there's one more surprise guest that we have in the audience. Um, if Alexander Freed could come up. Alexander is the author of Star Wars Battlefront Twilight Company. 
which will be out in November, November 3rd to be exact. And Alexander, if you could, uh, you know, tell the audience what brought you to Star Wars and then read a passage from, from your new novel, that would be fantastic. Sure. I am Alexander Freed. Um, I've been writing Star Wars stuff on and off for uh, 10 years now. Um, did a bunch of video games, and this is my first uh, Star Wars novel. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from near the beginning, um, in which a squad from Twilight Company, a uh, company of rebel infantry troops, is going into the governor's mansion on a planet to rescue a group of what they have been told are rebel hostages. Charmer came up with the squad's approach. Climbing the wall or besieging the main entrance would draw too much opposition. Factron would prep a frontal assault, but only for use as the last resort. Instead, Namir, Brand, and Charmer made their way to the rooftop garden of one of the neighboring residences. The occupants were more than cooperative after Namir burned three blaster holes in their custodial droid and stayed out of sight while Charmer secured a magnetic grappling gun in one of the flower beds. Brand watched the governor's mansion through the lenses of her armored mask. On her signal, Charmer fired the gun and sent the grapnel soaring through the resurgent rain. It struck the wall abutting one of the mansion's lower balconies, attached, and pulled the line taut. Namir traversed the gap first, sliding down the line and landing with a jolt on the damp stone. Charmer came next, then Brand. Brand severed the line with a curved knife that she pulled from her jacket. The blade hummed softly with electricity. Where'd you get that? Namir asked. Confiscated, Brand said. Namir glanced at Charmer, who pulled a stun rod from his belt and extended the baton. Looked like it would snap in two with a bit of effort. He passed it to Namir, who shook his head until Charmer pressed the weapon into his palm. I have my own knife, Charmer said, forcing the words past his stutter. You need an edge. Namir scowled, but didn't argue. It was true he didn't have the taller man's reach. We're heading in, he said, tapping his comm link. You hear screams, you know what to do. Gadron's deep voice came through, mixed with static. I will weep at your funerals, and after grieving, I will requisition a grapple that can support my mass. Many lives will be saved in the future. That's the spirit, Namir said. Together, the three proceeded into the mansion. The rooms were dark and spacious in the imperial style, appointed with lush carpets and glittering holographic mobiles that rotated and pulsed with the movements of the squad. Namir led the way through connected suites and into a tall, narrow hallway carved from mountain crystal. There, bronze busts and statuettes sat in niches along the wall. Namir didn't recognize most of the subjects. The men and women in the statuettes nearly all wore imperial military uniforms or robes of state. A bust of an elderly man with cheeks like melted wax and thinning hair bore a resemblance to the Galactic Emperor. Namir had seen him before in rebel propaganda videos. A horned figure might have been the Emperor's aged vizier. Namir dredged his memory for the name. Masa Meda? Charmer and Bran seemed more familiar with the lineup. Charmer scowled at a middle-aged man whose bulbous, alien eyes were set in a human face and whose neck was braced by a thick metal collar. The round collar gave the bust the appearance of a grotesque potted plant. Bran paused before the recreation of a misshapen helmet of curves and angles and skull-like eyes. You know him? Namir asked. Not personally, Brandt said. Darth Vader, Charmer said. He didn't stammer. The Galactic Emperor's personal enforcer, hound of the Rebel Alliance, born from the embers of the Clone Wars, perpetrator of every horror and atrocity known to civilization. So the stories went, anyway. Right, Namir whispered. Can we get on with it? To Namir's surprise, Brand looked at him and spoke in a low, somber tone. You should know these people, she said. Darth Vader, General Tulia, Count Vidian. Look at their faces and memorize every one. Namir returned Bran's stare, cool and calm. Bran didn't back down. I get it, Namir said softly. I do. You don't, Bran said, and began to walk again. Charmer, three steps ahead, gestured before the stairway at the end of the hall. Two fingers raised, thumb moving across the palm. Two guards stationed at the top of the stairs, one patrolling. Brand went first. In his darker moments, Namir resented the older woman's capacity for stealth. 
but not today, not when his own wet boots squeaked like rats on the polished floor. He followed her, tightening his grip on the stun baton, with the charmer so close behind he could feel the man's body heat. Up the stairs, two guards, neither in full armor, local security. Brand stepped out of the mouth of the stairwell, and Namir heard sizzling as the electrified knife found its first target. Namir charged forward, body low, looking for the patrol. Charmer would know to take the second guard behind him. The sentry on patrol was less than five meters away, and Namir felt his guts clench when they spotted each other, an Imperial stormtrooper. The trooper was still turning to face him. Namir had time to close the distance, but the stun baton would be useless against that white armor. He should have asked to borrow Brand's knife when he had had the chance. Namir raised his shoulder as he charged. He slammed into the stormtrooper and spun him to face the stairwell. Now at the trooper's back, Namir clung to the armor's cool surface and tried to pin the man's arms, prevent him from getting off even one shot with his blaster. That noise would alert the, the entire mansion, and their attempt at stealth would be compromised. The stormtrooper reacted swiftly, competently. He, he threw his head back, grazed Namir's scalp, where Namir's abandoned helmet should have protected him. If Namir had been standing straight instead of bending his knees, he would have taken the hit between the eyes. After a moment, he smelled burning metal and plastoid, and the stormtrooper went limp as Bran twisted her knife under the rim of his helmet. Namir tried to guide the body into a slide down onto the floor, but it clattered more loudly than he'd intended. Charmer stood between the two security guards, both dead on the ground. Bran had already cleaned her knife by the time Namir said, keep moving. The message warning Twilight about the governor's captives had included a rough map of the mansion. The hallway the team found itself in was now, at Namir's estimate, less than 50 meters from the captive's supposed location. If there was an ambush waiting, they'd be walking into it soon. Namir gave the rifle slung on his back a quick feel, confirmed he hadn't somehow lost its comforting bulk during the fight. Stealth would only take them so far, and he wanted to be ready. Charmer took the lead next. Namir didn't correct him. Somehow Charmer always wound his way to the front when an ambush seemed imminent for reasons Namir couldn't understand and couldn't bring himself to ask about. Losing his face hadn't broken Charmer of the habit. Namir certainly wouldn't be able to. Onward, down a cramped passage into a supply pantry that smelled of citrus, Namir assumed the scent was artificial until he saw that there was fruit, real fruit, casually stocked with the rest of the governor's boundless wealth. He drew one long breath of the aroma and then shook off the distraction. Past the pantry was a kitchen, sleek and metallic and packed with long-limbed droids nestled in their power stations. Charmer paused at the narrow door leading farther into the mansion and shrugged. The map indicated the captives were in the next room. Namir glanced at Brand as she took a position across the doorframe from Charmer. If anyone's been saving a flash bomb, Namir said, now's the time to speak up. No one did. Fine, Namir thought. No smoke cover, no flash. We breached the old-fashioned way. Didn't bother him. The old ways were what he knew best. He, clicked, he clipped the stun rod to his belt, took his rifle in both hands. Charmer and Brand mirrored him. Namir nodded. Charmer hit the door's keypad and they surged inside together. What they found was a dining hall, or what had been a dining hall, now so strewn with printouts and hollow displays and maps and portable screens that it resembled the inside of a bureaucrat's skull. Standing amid the makeshift workstations were half a dozen Imperial Army officers, caps doffed, expressions haggard, sweat staining their black uniforms, who were so intent on their work that it took half a second before they looked up at Namir and the squad. Namir took aim at the first man to reach for his sidearm, a sharp-nosed colonel who'd been pacing alongside the dining table, and watched the rest of the group hesitate. Brandon Charmer swept their rifles in steady arcs while Namir kept his eye on the colonel. Prisoners, he said. Where are they? What prisoners, the colonel asked. Namir's muscles were taut. He kept his voice calm. The ones you captured, he said, were the ones you claimed you captured. I have no idea what you're talking about, the colonel said. His right hand began to edge toward his belt. Namir cocked his head. The colonel froze again. He really doesn't, a voice replied, warm and resonant in the dining hall. Namir wanted to turn to look at the speaker, but taking his attention from the colonel would mean death. He kept his rifle aimed, kept his body turned toward his opponent, and trusted that Brand or Charmer would cover the remainder of the room. The new speaker slowly resolved in his peripheral vision. 
She was emerging from one of the side entrances to the hall, a human woman whose olive-skinned visage was lined with just lined it just enough to add gravitas to a once youthful face. Her black hair was, was threaded with gray and white, and she wore a dark formal suit trimmed with red and clasped with silver buttons. In contrast with the suit's obvious expense was a worn and stained duffel bag she'd slung over one shoulder, the kind a rebel soldier or a vagabond might carry. I'm the captive here, she said with bored disdain. The fact the colonel doesn't realize it as the woman spoke, she let the duffel bag slide from her right shoulder and land heavily on the floor. The words kept coming with this, that same idle tone as, while the bag fell, she drew a blaster pistol from her left pocket. I'm sure. going to stop you there and give you the to be continued because I'm getting the sign from the back that we are running out of time. And I wanted to open it up to the audience to see if you guys had any questions while you have all of the authors up here. We have a microphone right here, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to come up, um, and we'll do some lightning round questions. So, hi, how are you? Hi. Welcome. What is your question for the group? Um, well, I guess my question is kind of aimed towards Ian, I guess can be expanded to the group. Uh, where did you guys really kind of like, I guess like, aimed towards Ian initially, because you're working with Shakespeare and Star Wars, like where did you guys like find your like strongest inspirations directly for what you dove into in your stories? Uh, where did I get inspiration from? I mean, I, so I've been um, both a Star Wars fan and a Shakespeare fan for a very, very long time. Star Wars since I was a kid and Shakespeare since I was in high school. Um, and so it's for me, it's a combination of two passions, um, and two things that I just love dearly and, um, and wanted to combine in a way that gives equal, uh, you know, equal balance to both. Anything for anyone else, or? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, just very briefly, um, my original books are um, based on the original Grimm's fairy tales, the dark, scary Grimm's fairy tales. Um, and so um, I was thinking about, you know, George Lucas, when he s wrote Star Wars Story, described it as a fairy tale for the end of the millennium. Um, and so I was thinking of, um, of this as, as a fairy tale on sort of where I came from. Thank you. Uh, I mean, this is less of a question and more of a comment. I uh, got into Star Wars because of the extended universe, and uh, uh, Thrawn Trilogy was the first book I ever read when I was eight. Uh, that was a heavy thing to get into. Uh, <laughs> but I just want to thank you guys for doing these adaptations because it's something I wish that I had when I was a kid as a way to get people into reading because I personally think the Star Wars books are probably the most important way to continue the fandom that is Star Wars. Uh, so I really want to yeah. thank all of you guys. Thank you for reading. And, and I, I just want to say, uh, I'm in the middle of reading Aftermath right now, because I've been trying to read all of these books that are coming out now. Good luck. And yeah, it's, uh, whew, I've never been so happy to read so many Star Wars books in my life. And I'm loving all of it. Thank you guys. Great, thank you. I heard Vader being tall. Um, with, all, <laughs> um, with all the new Star Wars books coming out, where do like, the old books, and, like the expanded universe, um, like, what's their relevance, and where do they like, fall in place with the new, the new movie? If you're a fan of, of the expanded universe, you can still read it and enjoy it and love it. We do. Um, but with everything going forward, with The Force Awakens coming out in December, um, we looked at it and said this is a time, this is an all new time for us to get everyone excited about all new stories. Um, so hopefully everything that you heard from, from these fine folks up here gets you excited to say, ooh, I, I, I wanna see, I wanna read what they're doing. You know, I wanna find out about these new stories in Star Wars and, and even the new adaptations of, of four, five, and six, or one, two, and three through Shakespeare. Um, but there'll always be a place for, for the EU, so you know, hopefully you can read that stuff and, and love it, and then get into this and, and hopefully like it even more. Actually, if I could say something about that just real quick. There, Matt Groening, the guy who created The Simpsons, used to do this comic uh, before he did The Simpsons. And in the comic, there's a, a little uh, bunny, one-eared bunny named Bongo, playing with crayons, right? And a bully comes over to the one-eared bunny and breaks all of his crayons in half. 
and the bully kind of cackles, and uh, obviously it's meant to upset the little rabbit man, and the rab little rabbit kid looks at all the crayons, uh, and then there's like multiple panels of him just staring at these crayons, broken crayons, broken crayons, broken crayons. And then finally he's like, yay, now I have twice as many crayons. So that to me is the best way to look at these books. Hi guys. Um, I'm a part of Saber Guild, which is the Lucasfilm recognized essentially Jedi and Sith group. So my question for all of you is when it comes to original characters and original plot lines, how do you keep the integrity of Lucasfilms in the Star Wars universe? I'm sorry, that's, probably, that's so academic. No, no, that, that probably goes more toward, toward Chuck or, or yeah. Alexander, I would think. Very carefully. <laughs> With great responsibility. I mean, I, I think it's a matter of looking at, you know, what, what are the core themes of Star Wars and figuring out, all right, what's, what's most important and, you know, not, not doing everything based totally on those core themes, but making sure that they remain somewhere in there. Star Wars is about epic battle between good and evil. It's about uh, family. It's about, you know, big, you know, operatic emotions. Um, and you find those touchstones and you make sure that everything can at least return to those no matter how far out you build. Interesting. All right, thank you. Yeah, and when in doubt, we always just go back to the movies because that's, that's what it's all about, so. Great. Thank you. Uh, I just got a quick question for Yen. Is there any chance you're going to do audiobooks for Shakespeare? Uh, any what? Is there any chance you can narrate the audiobooks for the Star Wars Shakespeare version? In case that I did it? No, yeah. yeah. There are audiobooks of the, of the original trilogy, and they're wonderful, and they're done by people who do the voices way better than I do. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've been a Star Wars fan for five years, and I like how you make the books, and, like fairy tales and Shakespeare. And my question is, it is canon to the movies. Yes. Yeah, everything up here, everything that you're, you're seeing is authentic Star Wars. Uh, we take a little bit of artistic license every now and then, so you can have Star Wars uh, via William Shakespeare, or you can have Star Wars reinterpreted um, as you know, Alex and Adam and, and Tom have through, through their lenses, so you get some of their storytelling through it. Um, but something like you know, what, what Chuck is writing um, you know, or, or Alexander is, is authentic to the films. Uh, okay, uh, hi, uh, nice to meet all of you. I'd hate to be the third guy to bring up old EU stuff, but I was just wondering, like, since you guys are a new crop of authors and all, you know, I haven't seen anyone from the old stuff except uh, uh, James Luceno come back, but I was wondering, like, do any of you have, like, favorite books from the old non-canon stuff? Like, my example, my favorite would be, would be Shadows of the Empire. Like, what, what, what about you guys? Um, I grew up reading the expanded universe from ages like 8 to 13. All I wanted to read were Star Wars books, so that's really all I read. Um, my entry point into the expanded universe was the Young Jedi Knight series and the Junior Jedi Knight series. Um, but I really, my two favorites are still Shadows of the Empire and the Courtship of Princess Leia. Anybody else want to jump in? Or? Oh, well, I loved the. Uh you know, I'm older than you are, so uh, I didn't. The expanded universe had expanded less when I was reading, and um, those uh, the the Han the and Brian Chewie Daly and stuff. the Lando books—they yeah. were awesome, man. Yeah, are you with me on that? All right, all right. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. Anything by Mike Stackpole and all the wedge stuff and all the X-wing stuff, so good. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my question is for the people um, who are reinterpreting the, uh, who reinterpreted the uh, original movies. Um, how much creative license do you have to sort of make up, um, you know, scenes that weren't on screen? How much liberty do you have, and how much are you restricted in that? We were given, um, we were encouraged to uh, invent new scenes as long as they didn't contradict anything that happened on screen. So that was one of the most exciting parts of the project. Was they said. You know, obviously the movies are only of a certain length and many things happen that couldn't fit on the cellular that, you know, George Lucas didn't have time to film, you can imagine. Um, so uh, I think we all um, uh, had certain moments and scenes that we wanted to expand upon. So I have um, uh, Yoda tell a fairy tale to Luke, uh, which is, you know, part of his Jedi training and also sort of a Taoist uh, uh, parable, sort of inspired by Taoism. I know you guys each add. Yeah. 
Um, and I actually expanded, or I adapted certain off-camera scenes that you get from the radio drama, because I grew up with that, and I always felt like, to me, that was canon, so I wanted to reference that material for the E fans and whatnot. But I had to, obviously, adapt for young readers, so certain things didn't work, and I got to put my spin on them. So, yeah, I don't know. It, do you, you want to elaborate at yeah, all? Yeah, I, you know, I... I wanted to add a book, add, a, add like a chapter that would expand the book and be part of the book, but also just really wanted to add a scene. I mean, I just wanted there to be this scene that from now on, that's Tom Engelberger's scene. And it may never ever be filmed, it may ever, there may never be an action figure for that scene, but you know, anybody that ever remembers, uh, that reads my book will be like, oh, that's Tom's scene. And that was really important to me, man. To, to, yeah, can you imagine how mind blowing it is to get to add something to Star Wars? I, I used to think, gee, it would be great if I got to add like a bug or something to Star Wars. And I did. I gave Jabba nose, uh, nose par nasal parasites. Uh, so that was it. But then I was like, I can go even big. I can go beyond nasal parasites. I can, I can add a whole scene. So I actually added a scene uh, where Mon Mothma tries to get Princess Leia not to go to Endor because it's too dangerous. And the great side effect of that was that now Return of the Jedi passes the Bechdel test. So that was, that was important to me too. And with that, unfortunately, Thanks. we are out of time. Thank you so much for coming out today. Enjoy the out rest of, of Comic-Con. Nice.